I call Doug Beatty to move the motion. Thank you. The business committee has agreed to allow up to one and a half hours for this debate. You will have ten minutes to propose and ten minutes to wind. One amendment has been selected and is published on the Marshall list. Uh, please open the debate. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and I rise um, to, to move this motion. Uh, and I will be um, supporting the SDLP amendment on this because, again, it, it adds value, and anything that adds value uh, is, is positive. Paramilitarism is a scourge in our society, uh, on all of our communities. Those involved in paramilitaries are self-serving individuals who do so for profit, for self-proclaimed status, to control the working class with violence distilled through fear, and promoting a separated society creating a sense of distrust of the other community. And when I say paramilitarism groups here, I mean the UVF, I mean the UDA, I mean INLA, I mean RAD, I mean PIRA, Kyra, RIRA, and all other shades of paramilitary terrorist group. There can be no difference. In 2010-12, years after the Belfast Agreement, we still had 94 violent paramilitary crimes. That was 37 shootings and 57 assaults. The effects were the same. Whether it's a gun or a stick or a bat or a nail or a hammer, the results are exactly the same. Ruined lives. In 2016, the year we introduced the action plan on tackling paramilitarism, criminality and organised crime, there was a total of 85 attacks. The split be between the trend of shooting and, and, and assaults remained pretty much the same. And this went up in 2018. Before 2019, the last statistics, we now sit again at the 2016 figure of 85 paramilitary attacks, violent attacks, more than one a week. It's as if nothing has changed, even with the paramilitary task force. But we all know in this House that lots have changed because there's more to paramilitarism than just violent attacks. We have a duty in this Assembly to show leadership in tackling paramilitarism in word and in deed, and we cannot shy away from it. And I look to the Sinn Féin benches, and I know you don't want to hear it, but it's important that you do hear it, because your link with the IRA and the Army Council are destroying our society. Your arguments that they do not exist just does not hold water. The murder of Robert McCartney was met with a wall of silence. It was despicable, disgraceful crime, as was the murder of Paul Quinn in 2007, where the Sinn Féin MLA met the IRA to assure himself that they weren't involved, but they were involved. And then he gave them cover by saying Paul Quinn was involved in criminality. After the violent death of that young lad, they absolutely besmirched his name. It is absolutely disgraceful. Sinn Féin must distance himself from the IRA, past and present, and they must do it vigorously. There is no place for a political party which has a military wing. There is no place for a military wing to have a political party. But unionism must take a hard look at itself and ensure they distance themselves from loyalist paramilitaries as well. For far too long, active paramilitaries has torn their communities apart. Loyalist paramilitaries are, are responsible for extortion, intimidation, drug dealing, coercive control, self-styled brigadiers feeding off their communities. And communities are living in fear of loyalist paramilitaries. In its worst excesses, it results in murder. The murder of Ian Ogle was utterly vile. It was cowardly in the manner it was perpetrated. The Ogle family 
represent the reality for many people across working class areas in Northern Ireland. People out there are still using paramilitary gangs to torment communities. The intimidation of the Ogle family started long before Ian was murdered. A year on from that, families still aren't allowed to grieve in peace. They are still the victims of intimidation and attempts to alienate them from their community. I want to pay tribute to the Ogle family who are in the gallery, Vera and Tony, for their steadfastness and their courage in seeking justice over the murder of her partner and their father. They are loyalists who say they are protecting their community, but they are doing nothing more than damaging their community, and they must be rooted out. And they will only be rooted out if we, all of us in this room, take stock of our actions, take stock of our words, and tell them they are not acceptable, because it's not enough for us to say this is just down to civic community to do this, if we do not show the leadership. Of course, resourcing the police is going to help quite a lot, and I hope we do resource the police, because neighbourhood policing and the ward constable is the way forward in order for the people to link into a policeman that they know in order to help them get rid of these paramilitaries. And there must be other practical measures. Society is not balanced in the way we tackle paramilitaries. We try describing these paramilitaries as nothing more than criminals or organised crime gangs. And I'd be in favour of doing that. We seek evidence against them, make arrests, put them through the courts, and if found guilty, we jail them. Then we allow drug dealers to classify themselves as politically motivated offenders. We put them in a separated prison regime where they pick up their title of brigadier, and when they get released, they bring it back into their communities. It is absolutely ridiculous that on the outside of prisons, we say, you're a criminal, but when we put them in prison, we say, you're a brigadier. And when they come out with their self-importance, the whole cycle starts all over again. This House will know that in 2016, I brought forward a motion to end separated prison regime for that very reason. My motion gave eight years to reduce and then end that separated regime. If this Assembly had have supported me, we would have been halfway through that process and that would have been the point where we put, stopped putting in new admissions to the separated prison regime. But you didn't. When the chips were down, you didn't support it. And we are no further forward. I received abuse, I received threats, but I stood here and said it needs to end. And it does need to end. What we're doing is we're allowing ourselves and our society to be held hostage by the paramilitaries. The outworking of that is up there in the gallery, if you wish to look, the Ogle family. We should be supporting people like that. And there's many people like that around the country. Yes, of course. I'd like to thank the, the member for giving way. Would the member agree with me that um, it is with regret that two of my former colleagues lost their life uh, Two, former, uh, two prison officers, uh, David Black and Adrian Ismay, perhaps as a failure of us to challenge the segregated regime and end it, as you have already explicitly laid out before us today. Uh, thank you for the uh, in intervention, and you're, and you're absolutely right, because intelligence says that those prison officers were targeted from inside the prison, from inside that prison regime, that separated prison regime, targeted two men for murder. And we alert. We alert. It's time we stopped appeasing them and stood shoulder to shoulder with our communities and said no more. For those who want to make the transition, then they need to do it. There should be no inducement. Just do it. Move away from it. Become something positive in your community. Just move away from it. If you're waiting for somebody to put their hand in their pocket and pull out a wallet and give you money, then you've missed the point. It's time to end it for your community's sake, for your children's sake, for your family's sake. And if you don't, then I go back to the very start to say, you do this for profit. You do this for self-interest. You do this.
because you want to be seen the big lad in the pub with a pank saying, I'm the brigadier. Remember, start to wind his remarks, please. Those who do not wish to move away, then we need to chase them. We need to root them out. We need to bring every single thing available to get these people, to get the evidence and get them into jail. When we put them in jail, we treat them like criminals. That's how we're going to deal with this. Member's time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Member. I call on Patsy McLone to move the amendment. Uh, um, and I thank the proposer of the motion for his uh, for delivery. So, sorry, oh, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, you will have ten minutes to propose and five minutes to wind, and all other speakers will have five minutes. So, please open the debate. You should have said you should have known better. <laughs> thank you for that, but you know a bit late, so. Um, <clears throat> thank you. And can I begin by thanking the proposers of the motion for bringing this debate to the House today. The presence, prevalence and insidious influence of paramilitary gangs in our community should be a matter of immense concern for all members. Their, their operation is an or organised opposition to our collective efforts to sustain peace and deliver for the people we represent through exclusively peaceful means. Our amendment to the motion is designed to be constructive and build on the sentiment that the proposers have introduced here today by identifying some of the methods by which the new executive can disrupt and dismantle paramilitary gangs. And it's just that those methods may not be exclusive to the executive itself. <clears throat> it is also designed to give voice to those communities that have tried to break from the grip of paramilitarism, but who feel that through the cycle of poverty, deprivation and inequality, the odds are stacked against them. And that paramilitarism involves murder, extortion, fuel laundering, cigarettes, drugs, organized crime, human trafficking, prostitution, to name but a few. It involves to tackle those issues. Yes, the organized crime task force with HMRC. If Mr. Bling, with no apparent means to his name, is sailing about in a BMW with lots of gold tripping from him. It's not too hard to figure out if it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it must be an extortionist paramilitary. Any plan to eradicate the influence of paramilitaries and criminal gangs must recognise that inequality and the lack of opportunity are critical recruitment tools for those intent on ruining the lives of a new generation. If we want to stop them, we need to provide these communities with the opportunity for a better life. And indeed, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, that was touched upon in the earlier debate around some of the domestic and violent activities of, of individuals. So I hope the proposers of the motion take this amendment as a supportive supplement to the proposal. We cannot, Mr. Speaker, pretend that the recurring influence of paramilitaries isn't a feature of this society that needs to be overcome. It is a fundamental part of the unfinished business of our peace process. And while parties here will disagree on the profile of the provenance of paramilitary gangs, or indeed on the most appropriate operation response to their threat, it is important that we send a united message to those involved, whoever you think your struggle is against. Whether it's republicanism or loyalism apparently, Irish unity or the British state, allegedly, you are wrong. Every act of violence is a violation of the will of the people of this island, north and south. Your fight is with the people of Ireland, and that is a fight you never, ever will win. It is important, members, that we do not allow our different approaches to this issue, or different emphases maybe of approaches to this issue, or to the issue of legacy to be interpreted as division on the core matter. There is no tolerance for those who have set themselves against the direct wishes of our people for peace. As parties, we should have a coherent and consistent shared standards which recognise and reject paramilitary interests. Our shared approach should be about rooting out paramilitarism in all its forms, not singling out particular groups or particular parties. A whole community approach, which the SDLP has long called for, would send a powerful message to those whom we represent and those who oppose these institutions. 
And that should present a challenge to us all as members of the Assembly. It isn't enough to issue stale statements of condemnation when there's a security alert in our own constituencies. Recycling the same words and sentiments when it's close to home just isn't enough. Because the truth is that a bomb in Derry or Belfast is as much as a threat to people, for people living in Mid-Ulster or Newry or anywhere else, as if it had been placed in one of our towns. We should see every vestige of paramilitary activity as an attack on all of us and respond as one community united in our commitment to ending coercive controls of these gangs on our society. But it's easy to talk about unity in this House in March, removed from the context of difficult situations. Our commitment to tackling paramilitarism together is more often tested in the white heat of controversy in the summer months. I won't dwell on this, but it's worth saying that when political messages on paramilitarism appear capricious, self-serving or indeed divided, it only compounds the working challenges for those trying to help communities transition away from those ingrained paramilitary interests. They thrive on division. It must be our mission to stay close to each other when times are difficult. It must also be said that it would be easier to stay closer on these issues if these institutions were clearly able to allay the misgivings that have previously been expressed that programme money unduly follows paramilitary-related entities or that employment driving from some community funding is unfairly given to those with chosen paramilitary associations. If I could now turn to the terms of the amendment and specifically the additional tools that the PSNI and the courts need to disrupt and dismantle these criminal gangs. Members will be aware that the absence of a functioning executive has led to a lag in the introduction of unexplained wealth orders here. I welcome the comments that the Justice Minister has made previously that she intends to bring forward the necessary provisions to activate the implementation of these orders. And it would be useful, I'm sure maybe she will later on, outline a timetable for the introduction of the necessary regulations, please. <clears throat> it is important for confidence in policing and in our efforts to tackle paramilitaries and criminal gangs that people see a relentless pursuit of those who have amassed significant assets as a result of criminality. How many times have members of this assembly tried to encourage people to bring information to the police only to be told that the dogs in the streets know who is behind the drug dealing or punishment beatings or racketeering? And that's because they live in big houses, drive flash cars, and they appear invulnerable to the law. Indeed, it's suggested that some of those are agents, and that must be put on record here too. It is not unreasonable to suggest that those who have significant assets with no immediate evidence of a means to support it and who are suspected of being implicated in serious criminal wrongdoing should have to account for those assets. And we cannot pretend that there is no correlation between those who have previously exercised coercive control over communities under the guise of armed struggle and those who now exercise the same form of control for profit. They haven't gone away. You know. It's important that every tool be available to bring these gangs to justice. This must be the beginning of a sustained assault on the infrastructure of criminal control that exists in far too many communities. We must also acknowledge that this just isn't a matter for the Justice Minister to tackle. And I did refer earlier to the likes of HMRC. Nor will resource alone bring to an end those who prey on our communities or on insecurities or fears. We need a whole executive approach to dealing with the causes of poverty, deprivation and the deep-seated inequalities that exist, particularly in working class will communities. The member give way? Certainly I will. Yes. Thank the member for giving way. Will the member agree with me that in dealing with the, the, with the past and particularly around the legacy mechanisms as established, that are to be established in the Stormont House Agreement, it's imperative that those are done sooner rather than later because we need the truth of what was done in the past, the horrible truth to be told in full and all those responsible held to account? Absolutely. I think it's vital that we have the truth because without the truth, people will live with that sense of injustice. And that too can be fed upon and perpetrated by these people who tend to uh, well, portray themselves, isn't the only way to put it, as defenders of communities and the likes. And without that, just, without that sense of justice permeating society, 
those people will still see a void, however misguided to fill. Um, also, there's the requirement for investing in communities that have yet to, be, to experience the peace dividend. It means ensuring that we have regionally balanced, a regionally balanced economy that provides opportunity for everyone. It means levelling up our ambition for new housing. It means investing in the infrastructure needed to allow towns and cities across the north to flourish. We should be building a society that provides everyone with the security of a job and the dignity of a home. It is those communities that have been let down the most that are most at risk of paramilitary and criminal control. I would therefore ask members to support our efforts and the, the, amend, the amendment that we have made here today in some effort to deal with the insidious influence of these gangs. And uh, we, we're, we're happy to hear that uh, the member has agreed to support our amendment too. Uh, Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul Gibbon. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the member for Upper Van, Mr. Beatty, for bringing the motion uh, before the Assembly uh, today. Uh, and uh, from the outset, let me indicate we'll be supporting uh, the motion and we'll also be supporting the amendment that's been brought forward uh, by the SDLP. We think it enhances uh, the motion. Indeed, it reflects uh, one of the amendments uh, that we had wished to bring forward in respect of the unexplained wealth orders. And so, to that end, uh, we'll give support uh, to it. Uh, the issue of paramilitarism is something uh, that has been uh, a challenge for our society for decades, and it was wrong in the past, and it's wrong today, to have paramilitary organisations. Uh, and we need to have an effective uh, response to that. And whenever I look at how the police engage with uh, paramilitary organisations, I recognise that they have a policy. It's outlined uh, in terms of their policy that their engagement must be for a clear policing purpose. The subsequent interactions must be necessary, lawful and proportionate, and in line with the Code of Ethics. So that's a, an uncomfortable truth that I think members need to face up to, that there is engagement with uh, individuals associated with paramilitary organisations. There's also uh, policies in place, whether written or unwritten, uh, because we see it where officials from the housing executive, officials from other public sector organisations engage with individuals that would be regarded as local community representatives. I suspect that happens right across every constituency. And members will be able to cite examples of where that takes place. Again, that's an uncomfortable truth that people need to face up to. It is the uncomfortable reality that paramilitary organisations exist and individuals still exist associated with them. That does not make it right. And therefore, there needs to be a response to that that brings us to the stage where paramilitary organisations no longer exist, and we see the transition that people have talked about taking place. I'll give way to Mr. Alistair. Would the member ever think that those organisations might continue to exist in part because of the encouragement that they draw from this House? Uh, where else in the world would you have a security assessment that the structures of the IRA remain in existence, the Provisional Army Council is still there, the IRA continues to have access to weapons, and that the IRA Army Council oversees both the IRA and Sinn Féin. How on earth do we ever defeat paramilitaries? by allowing the example to be set through the institutions of this House that a paramilitary organisation controls a party of government. Has one minute extra. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I'm going to come on to the issue of the provisional IRA very quickly because I, I notice that my time is going. But the, the member makes a valid point that we need to know exactly what is going on when it comes to the provisional IRA. That's why I and colleagues have been raising this issue at the Justice Committee. It was raised with the Justice Minister during question time. Where is the assessment? Because it's there from 2015. In terms of the assessment, the Garda Commissioner has been able to indicate that he stands over that assessment, but the Chief Constable, when he came to the committee, didn't answer it. But yet the police have been able to give press releases uh, to different media outlets. I think we need to know 
the extent of paramilitary organizations, their uh, criminality they're, that they're engaged in, because that's the only effective way that you can deal with them. Now, that response in 2015 talked about those members of power involved in electioneering and leafleting and, and all of that other aspects to it, and that's fine. Uh, however, if you're an individual and someone comes to your door who's been engaged in, for example, the Shangle bomb, one, one might want to ask, is it really appropriate for that individual to be involved in electioneering? But uh, until we get a proper and up-to-date assessment and people face up to the issue of what is the status of para, what is the level of criminality that para members are involved in, because it talked about them being engaged in large-scale smuggling. We need to find out the extent of that, uh, and therefore we need to have an assessment of it. So I support the amendment that's been put forward because we do need to see the unexplained wealth orders uh, so that people actually uh, can have their assets uh, seized from them, because until people see action, uh, then uh, they're not going to have confidence in the law enforcement agencies to be able to effectively deal with people that masquerade uh, under the banner of paramilitary organisations uh, engaged in criminality. Uh, the Chief Constable indicated that he would like to see the Assets Recovery Agency uh, brought back to Northern Ireland. I would like to see uh, that being uh, developed to see is that something that would become an effective tool in going after and targeting uh, paramilitary organisations. Uh, and if it is, it's something that will get the support of our party. Uh, and I, I also uh, want to see uh, what more the National Crime Agency are doing, because it took a lot of work to get this House to get to support the NCA. People resisted it, and eventually we got there. Uh, but we need to see Remember everybody Wayne supporting remarks, please. the forces of law and order, including the National Crime Agency. So I support the motion, and I support the amendment, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and I call Jerry Kelly. Uh, I thank the members for bringing this important uh, motion to be debated, and I stand to speak in favour both of the motion and of the amendment. And I see that's where all, all the other parties are at. Uh, I should also declare that I'm a member, a current member of the Policing Board. I won't speak in here. John Crowley, the Fresh Start Agreement was published by the Executive in both the British and Irish governments in November 2015. It included commitments to tackle paramilitaries and organised crime. The Executive Action Plan was published in July of the following year, containing 43 recommendations. Now, the Action Plan was predicated on the need for a law enforcement response to the criminal gangs and their activities, but importantly, in tandem with a systemic, sustained and collaborative uh, response tackling the underlying issues of socio-economic na socio nature, which are endemic to the areas in which these gangs mostly operate in. I know Doug Biggie went through a number of statistics, but in 2019, the recorded statistics of paramilitary abuse was that there was two deaths, 18 casualties of shooting, and of the 18 attacks, eight occurred in Derry and Saban and eight in Belfast. There were also 67 recorded casualties of assault by various organisations. Five of these attacks were on people under the age of 18. There were also 15 bombing incidents and 39 shooting incidents, and there were 147 arrests with the result in 18 people being charged. I want to add to that the fact that there were threats uh, given out to a number of political representatives. Uh, on an ongoing basis, there are threats given out against community workers and indeed a wide range of threats to Sinn Féin uh, members. The Independent Reporting Commission was established by both governments to report annually on progress made, especially on the implementation of the relevant measures for the three administrations. The IRC's second report was published in November of last year and outlined the imperative of a sustained, long-term and holistic effort that combines a policing and justice response alongside a major and energetic tackling of the deep socio-economic issues facing the communities where these criminal gangs are here. Well, I'm grateful to the member for giving way. In a previous debate and in this, we have now heard on more than one occasion socio-economic deprivation. Does the member not agree that ultimately individuals are individuals and they choose to engage in criminal activity and there is no excuse that can be found lying in a defence of socio-economic deprivation? The member has one extra minute. 
Well, I thank you for that. I don't necessarily disagree with that. Of course, individuals are responsible for what they do. But you cannot ignore the underlying socio-economic issues in communities. So you have to take a holistic view, view with that as well. And if you want to draw people away from it, then as other members have already said, then you need, you need a full government approach. And I will be talking to that in, in a moment. These issues are complex and ingrained in the fabric of uh, these communities requiring a new dedicated outcome in the programme for government as the best way to achieving whole of system approach. So essential for the success of this project. Now, policing and criminal justice response is essential, so I agree with you entirely on that. Um, but in isolation from an accompanying community empowerment response, cannot deliver the required outcome that we all want, everyone in this house and indeed outside this house. The IRC's second report also contained a number of other key recommendations. A greater emphasis to be placed on the correct use of civil recovery powers, and as has been mentioned a number of times, this would also involve unexplained uh, wealth orders being introduced, an increased provision of dedicated neighbourhood policing teams, which should be fully resourced. Again, information that goes to try and deal with this is at its base, at the base of policing, is uh, community empowerment and community policing. The introduction of measures to improve the effectiveness of the justice system, and these are aimed at increasing the pace at which the justice system works, with a view to building public confidence and uh, support, especially in communities which have become disengaged from the criminal justice agencies. So all these things are connected. To conclude, if we are really intent on wanting to tackle effectively and seriously degrade these major criminal gangs, then the twin track approach outside or outlined above is essential to achieving our shared objectives, and they are not mutually exclusive in any way. I note that the Chief Constable commenting on the publication of the new decade, the approach, has welcomed commitments pertaining to these points. And as a member of the Policing Board, I can also say that policing of the community is central to confidence in policing and the commitment to increasing neighbourhood teams is fundamental to that. I urge the members to support uh, the motion and attendant uh, um, amendment. Uh, Mayor. Thank you. And I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I speak on behalf of the Alliance Party and welcome the tabling of this motion addressing a key concern for many people across Northern Ireland, especially those living under the grip of criminals masquerading as paramilitaries. Nearly 22 years after the Good Friday Agreement, people are rightly fed up and want to see the rule of law apply to every part of Northern Ireland and paramilitary organisations gone for good. The process of transitioning towards a culture of lawfulness as part of our post-conflict transformation has been far, far too slow. The reasons for such are many, with improved statutory response always something we should explore, but it would be wrong to point the blame at others when it's fact, in fact political leaders who share a significant burden of responsibility. I acknowledge the complexity of our past, but until we finally declare that all violence in the past, whether by organisations, individuals or the state, was wrong, and should never be glorified or excused, we will continue to lend justification to those seeking to legitimise their actions in the present. Whether in 1970 or 2020, all paramilitary activity was and is wrong. If, however, people are willing and committed to transitioning to a new lawful future, which recognises that the only organisation whose writ should run large is the police service of Northern Ireland, then we must embrace and assist. As David Trimble stated, just because someone has a past doesn't mean that they can't have a future. But when they are in fact still living in the past and denying others a future as a result of their criminal activities, such as drug dealing, done under the cover and veil of illegal paramilitary organisations, then the only future those people should have is in prison. Tacit or explicit tolerance and endorsement of these people must end. Words must be matched with actions. You cannot vote for this motion and then stand side by side with individuals known to be still involved in paramilitarism Failure to stand up to those known to be actively involved in paramilitarism and instead meeting up 
Endorsing and legitimising only serves to worsen the situation endured by local communities. Inhibiting statutory bodies to act when elected political representatives send out messages of acceptability. It's only the police, courts and rule of law which should be given respectability in Northern Ireland in 2020, properly resourced and with all leg necessary legislative powers. Picking up my local newspaper last week to read that the number of households declared homeless in Ards and North Down because of paramilitary threats has almost doubled since 2016 is just one of a number of reasons why we must take action. I am therefore content to support the motion and amendment, but in the knowledge that we can have all the laws and all the funding we like and all the motions passed, but to effectively tackle and end paramilitarism, it must be a collective effort across the executive, in this chamber, at councils and in communities. Local people are being locked out of opportunities to grow and prosper by paramilitary gatekeepers who control, dominate and exploit but by working together, addressing the circumstances used to recruit people into their criminal empires and adopting a zero-tolerance approach to figures actively involved in paramilitarism, we can together turn the words that are being expressed here tonight into action. It's an important we do that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Call Joanne Bonding. I wish to declare my membership of the Northern Ireland Policing Board. Thank you to those who brought this motion forward giving us a chance to discuss properly this scourge that has blighted our land and our communities for decades. It's scandalous that some 22 years after the Belfast Agreement, after all the promises of ceasefires and standing down, that paramilitarism continues, albeit in a different guise. But then what's a mere lie to those who engage in violent beatings and murder? Let me be clear. It was just as wrong then as it is now, and it has been all along on all sides. But like the parasite it is, paramilitarism has morphed and mutated to fit its own needs and gain. And long gone are the days when those who engaged took the view that they were defending their people, that there was a cause. Now, the only protection the community wants or needs is from those who purport to be their protectors and defenders. The only cause is lifestyle, status, money, and drugs. There's no political or religious cause. There's only crime, organized crime, drug dealing, loan sharking, racketeering, keeping their own people in line through threats and intimidation. And my constituency of East Belfast has seen more than its fair share. They murder their own because of perceived slights or insults. For hard men, they have very sensitive egos. Just ask the McCartneys, and more recently the Ogles. And I've met with both, and I stand with both. There is no justification for people being chased, beaten, and stabbed to death in the street or on a farm, as in the case of Paul Quinn. Folks are sick of working themselves into the ground to raise their children and give them a decent life, and they're just about making ends meet, while watching people who have seldom, if ever, worked a day in their lives, or who apparently have modest jobs, but are living in great houses with the best of everything, and cars and clothes and holidays, which do not reflect their supposed income. Now, we see young adults owned by organizations, working to pay off drug debts, and even worse, coming at an arranged time, often driven to the appointed place by a loved one, to be beaten, maimed, or shot. It seems as if these gangs do so without fear. And I've regularly challenged the PSNI as to who runs Northern Ireland. Is it the lawless? Pat, if you don't mind, I'm gonna keep on. Thank you very much. Is it the lawless or is it the lawful? There's no question these gang masters and their minions consider themselves to be judge, jury, and executioner. The problem is that this view can be reinforced by delays in the justice system. Unquestionably, the slow pace of the system in a society which demands obediency contributes to the context in which there are those who reach the end of their tether and approach the paramilitaries for swift justice 
in the form of an assault or the threat of one. Thankfully, we're seeing a change of, in views. The grip is loosening. Recent DOJ statistics show a 46% a decrease in the view that paramilitary assaults are justified in certain circumstances. Moreover, 68% of those living in mainly loyalist areas and 62% of those mainly living in Republican areas disagree that paramilitary groups keep the area safe. People are seeing through them and long may it continue. The communities have had enough and have found their voices and the strength to say enough. Now it's the responsibility of politicians, the PSNI and the courts to come in behind them with support, investigations, convictions and adequate sentencing. If people are to come forward, often at great risk to their own and their family's safety, they must feel that the support, protection and follow-up will be worth that risk. Otherwise, the fear and the coercion will re-establish itself and the information will run dry. Clearly, we're beginning to see some fruit from the Ending the Harm campaign. However, it's imperative that this work is not undermined by statutory agencies and departments, including but not limited to councils, the PSNI and the NIHE. Often, as, as has been stated, the gatekeepers in a community are afforded access to senior officials in a community, uh, as senior officials in these organisations that the average citizen is not. The member bring remarks to a close. Which I will give way. Would the member agree with me that the area board, for example, really should be including tackling paramilitarism within their action plan and the fact that it doesn't sends out the wrong message? I think that's absolutely right. One minute, one Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think that's right. And I think that all councils should be considering it in their community plans. Um, the average citizen is not afforded such access, and this in turn serves to underscore and legitimise their credibility and standing. This is equally applicable to the Parades Commission, and I've raised this matter directly with them. We cannot, on the one hand, expend millions of pounds to reinforce the message that paramilitarism will no longer be tolerated and our society must move on and desist from glorification of terror, whilst having this message entirely undermined annually by the IRA's D Company parade in Belfast, which sees participants dressed as active combatants. There is a world of difference between celebrating heritage and history, as we're all entitled to do, and the glorification of a terrorist campaign. Undoubtedly, there are those who have turned Number their lives around. Are close. I will do, Mr. Speaker, and to now use their influence to show young people there's a better way, and they should be assisted. I welcome the results achieved by the Paramilitary Crime Force. I urge them to follow the money, and I urge the Minister to bring forward the criminal finances legislation Members, time is up. to allow those involved to be fully resourced to bring these individuals to justice and these Members, gangs time to is an up. end. Thank you. And I call Sean Lynch. I'll get to Con Collier. And as a member of the Policing Board, I rise to speak in support of the motion and the amendment. The motion in itself is too narrow in its scope. Tackling serious criminality is not solved by police alone. However, they do have an important role to play. These criminal groups and their activities are mostly embedded in communities which also suffer social and economic problems, including poverty, unemployment, education under achievement, drugs and alcohol addiction, and poor mental health. The IRC report published late last year stated this will require the twin-track approach set out in the first report, i.e. a policing and justice response side-by-side side with a fundamental and sustained tackling of underlying problems within these communities where criminal networks operate. Chief Constable also confirmed this at a recent policing board meeting. There is a need for an input from all relevant agencies. The IRC report goes further in saying the comprehensive tackling of criminal gangs must become an expressly stated and dedicated outcome of the programme of government. Where the police do play an important role is by providing neighbourhood policing and implementing a key theme in the policing plan, policing with the community. This is about building the relationship between police and the community. By adopting this approach, the PSNA can demonstrate that they understand the needs and problems of the community. PCSPs play an important role working with partners and communities so the PSNA can help to make a positive difference to improve the lives of communities and individuals. There is evidence to support the benefits of a sustained policing presence in local communities to prevent crime and enhance community safety. Where people feel safe and have confidence in policing can encourage cooperation with the police in provision of vital information and reporting of crime. This is an essential 
building block in the process of tackling criminal gangs. If we take the example of Limerick, which was blighted by gangland crime some years back, community policing was particularly successful in building better relationships between the Gardaí and disadvantaged neighbourhoods in Limerick. In a 12-month period, figures showed a marked and continued decline in violent crime rates. There was also a twin-track approach in Limerick. The Chief Executive on Limerick County Council coordinated a programme of addressing the issues of social ex exclusion in the city. As a result, Limerick is a much safer city today. The twin-track approach is fundamental in tackling organised crime is, is to be successful. I thank the member for giveaway, and I have listened to his comments in relation to talking to the police. I find that interesting given the fact that he did not come very clean in terms of his actions in 1986. Uh, he went to jail, obviously, for his part. But more or equally as worrying is a comment in the book that has been published by uh, Mr Kelly, where Mr Adams says about telling the truth. There may, of course, be omissions in how the story is told. How could it be otherwise? I am sure Jerry, referring to Jerry Kelly, has no wish to go back to prison or to be responsible for others going there. I certainly would not blame him for that. So if we are going to have a twin-track approach, if we are going to tell the police, then when are we going to actually have the truth about what everybody was involved in so that those who feed of our society have no justification for looking up to some people as though they are local heroes? Member has one extra minute. Uh, I get, uh, and I note the, the members' um, remarks, but, but I do not agree with them. There is need to empower and support local communities in resisting and rejecting paramilitary control. Sinn Féin agrees with the Independent Reporting Commission, as set out in the most recent report, on the need for a multi-layered approach to tackling serious criminality, including effective criminal justice responses along community empowerment and a systemic and sustained response to social and economic issues experienced in the working class communities upon which these gangs prey. We totally reject those who continue to engage in criminality, intimidation and control and give full support to those agencies working to close down criminal ne networks and activities. I call on the Minister of Justice to ensure the PSNA, other agencies and community responses are supported and properly resourced to allow them to increase their efforts in addressing ongoing criminality. To conclude, I understand that these issues are complex and ingrained in the fabric of communities. They require new, dedicated outcomes in the pro programme of government. This is the best way forward of achieving success in ending criminality. Thank you. And I call Paul Fru. Uh, and I rise to welcome this motion here today, as I talked earlier about the three crime motions that we have before us. It really tells a tale with regards to private members and their, their pulse in the community. Uh, but we have a responsibility here in this House as elected representatives to be role models and to show society how we can behave and what we should tolerate and what we shouldn't. It is not good enough to justify actions of the past when actions of the same ilk happen today. It is not good enough to say it was in the past, and it was OK then, and it is not OK now. It is not in the past. There are victims and survivors who live with this on a daily basis. It is not in the past. It is their day to day. And even if you do come out with that, that it is not right to bomb up a street or a town or a busload of workers. Even if you come out to condemn that now, does it not undermine your very argument? Is it not hypocrisy and duplicity when you go the very next night to some shindig to celebrate a prison break or to tell stories about ticking around on the leg when you were getting chased by the RUC and you managed to nip over the border? There is an onus in all of us to tell the people fairly and squarely that terrorism is wrong. It has always been wrong. It wrought death and destruction on our people. 
And you aren't any great saviors of your people. In fact, you hurt your own. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And it's not in the past, because it's happening now, and it's challenging this whole house. We have a finance minister who just will not say the words, Paul Quinn was not a criminal. And the finance minister doesn't get it. It's not what he said those years ago in 2007, which really did put a, a skur on the family and hurt them deeply. But it's not, it's not what he said then. It's what he's not saying now. And it echoes and hurts the... F yes, I will. Member for learning intervention. Paramilitarism has left scars on families and communities. Will the member agree that paramilitarism, criminality, coercive control and intimidation are wrong and always were wrong? Will the member also agree that there is no place in this House, 22 years after the Good Friday Agreement, for anyone to give cover to blatant paramilitarism and co coercive control, and by so doing, further victimise victims such as Paul Quinn and his family. I agree. Member Sorry. has one minute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I agree perfectly with that statement. And I, can I commend the SDLP? Not only now, in the, the, the days and hours we're in this place, but for the years that you took the abuse. In, in Republican areas and from Republican representatives for standing strong and saying that violence is wrong. And I commend you for that. Violence is wrong. But can I, can I centre, Mr Speaker, on hope? On hope for the future. Because you know something? We can see it. We're all moving on. We're all getting older. But we're seeing a younger generation of politicians. And I would say to those politicians now, especially from the party opposite, because there is an issue which undermines this House. And, of course, the debate is raging in the Republic of Ireland also, because they might glimpse a bit of sovereign power. And, of course, that's a very dangerous place for the Republic of Ireland to be in. But can I plead with the younger members of Sinn Féin to take away the shackles of the Army Council, to remove the coercive control that you're all under with regards to the bogeymen and the shadows, to cut it loose and concentrate on pure politics to make our society better. You have the power, you have the choice, if you choose to take it. And I hope you do, because no one else can do it but yourselves. But it's not right to condemn the actions of others and then say, but it was okay in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s. It wasn't. For the young members of Sinn Féin, do not fall for the spin of the glorification of terrorism. There is no glory at all. There is no glory in being on the run. There is no glory in lying on a concrete floor of a safe house with nobody and, and no company but the, your conscience after you have done an act of criminality and terrorism. There is no company and no glorification in that. There is no glorification in being an informer and telling your agents all the information you know. And it is true that terrorism was beaten in this place. It is true that the security forces strangled, strangled ter terrorism to the point where it could operate. That's why we got a peace process. And we should have known, we should have known members in the Belfast Agreement, when only weeks after, when prisoners got out of prison, with clenched fists and your hose, what we were going to be in for and, and the prolonged period of terrorism criminality we have had to face ever since. We want to see an end of it. There can be no Remember toleration of it. Close. It must end now. Thank you. And I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I rose initially to speak um, in favour of the amendment tabled by my party colleagues, but since we're in the fortunate position of everyone else in the House um, uh, agreeing with the amended motion, I don't have to do too much to convince people. Um, I wrote remarks um, on this, um, on the motion and on the amendment we had made um, 
without, I suppose, naively imagining that we wouldn't um, devolve very quickly into a debate about the past in this place. And of course, in a sense, it's not wrong entirely that people do talk about the past because, as we know, the past is intimately related to the present. But in the spirit of discussing the, um, the amended motion, um, the, the broad scope of the motion put down by Doug Beattie and others is to be welcomed. The, the amendment we've tabled is offers a specific analysis of the context in which paramilitary, paramilitarism and criminality continue to thrive in communities across Northern Ireland. And also, um, as my colleague Patsy McGloon said, details specific additional powers that we think um, should be deployed and quickly to address this scourge on our society. And I know that the Justice Minister is already thinking about how they can be deployed quickly. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in the last few weeks, we've talked a lot about how these institutions need to win the confidence of people here. We know we need to manage resources better. We know we need to deliver public services. We know that we need to focus on real, meaningful change to people's lives, and not just to the lives of those in our own particular tribe, but to everyone's lives. If we are serious, we must recognize that too many working class communities in Northern Ireland are forced to live under the heel of paramilitarism, or more specifically, a paramilitary ga of criminal gangs Yes, I will give way. Yeah. To the member for giving way, I could take the member back to the comments of my colleague, Ms. Bunting, about the way in which senior officials, whether it's at the Parades Commission, the Housing Executive, the institutions and the organs of the state, senior officials who engage directly with paramilitaries will never live in the communities that he describes. They will never live in the communities in which these paramilitaries operate. They get to rub shoulders with them and then get to go home to nice middle class communities where they don't have to deal with the behaviour of paramilitaries. Um, well, I agree in part with what, the, with, what the, um, with what my constituency colleague has said. And actually, I'm going to come on to talk a little bit about that. A little bit about that. Um, he is right in the sense that working class communities at the forefront of conflict are not people bluntly like all of us, like, like us, well, certainly like myself, and I, and I confess to being someone who, who didn't live at the forefront of conflict. That's why it's, there's an even greater onus on those of us in this House to deal with issues that confront working class communities. Anyway, we are 22 years on from the Good Friday Agreement, as several um, members have mentioned. This Assembly and the Executive, sporadic though our functioning has been, are products of that agreement and our existence is a good thing. But if we are honest, Many of the benefits of those institutions and our imperfect peace have not flowed to working class communities that were on the front line of the conflict. Too often, those communities remain under the coercive control of criminal elephants, criminal elements, pardon me, that are either explicitly associated with paramilitary groups or are controlled by former members and others, including my colleague Patsy McGloan and indeed Doug Beattie, uh, detailed vividly the activities of those um, uh, blinged up brigadiers who go into their communities and demand obedience and inflict nothing but misery on those communities. Um, while I agree with the initial motion in the name of Doug uh, and others that the PSNI and law enforcement agencies must be resourced, um, and I welcome the more explicit public backing recently from other members, uh, uh, from other parties in this assembly for the PSNI recruitment campaign, we cannot pretend that ongoing paramilitarism and criminality exists in a vacuum. It is, to use a phrase that used to be familiar in this place, inextricably linked to the vulnerability of communities with high deprivation and low opportunity. Mr Deputy Speaker, our amended motion acknowledges that, that intersection and it offers a more explicit suggestion for hitting these gangs where it hurts in their pockets. Unexplained wealth orders are already available to the National Crime Agency, but they need to be made available to the Police Service of Northern Ireland as a matter of urgency. Mr Speaker, paramilitary violence was always wrong. It always inflicted the, inflicted the greatest harm on the poorest and most vulnerable communities. And that is still the case today. And glorification of violence is a problem, and it is wrong. We are nearly five years on from the Fresh Start Agreement, which pledged to, to end paramilitarism. Um, and of course, we had the, the action plan, which came out a year later, and, and several, have, several others have detailed that and how that's been stalled by the absence of these institutions. And we're one year on from the appalling murders of Ian Ogle in East Belfast and Lyra McKee in Derry. Yes, I will give way to my colleague. Uh, thanks very much, Member, for giving way. 
Um, Member, would you agree that paramilitaries are still controlling communities with fear, fear and exploration? And this is evident by the fact that over the past year, paramilitary shootings are up 46%, paramilitary assaults up 9%, and bombings up 12%. Meanwhile, arrests are down by 22%. Would the member agree that strategies are failing and that three years of stagnation has not helped matters and has allowed for paramilitaries to gain a stronger foothold in society again? Right, the, the member's time is up. Thank you very much. Well, I'll, I'll conclude my, my, my comments with that. Thank you very much, oh. uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to call uh, the final speaker, Andy Allen. First of all, I'd like to thank the member for agreeing to take the final two minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as you've outlined, I only have two minutes, so I'll attempt to keep my comments concise and to the point. Mr. Speaker, as we've already heard from other members right across this chamber, we have individuals masquerading as paramilitaries. They betray themselves of, as defenders of communities, as heroes, but that couldn't be further from the truth, Mr. Speaker. They're nothing but cards. They're criminals. They prey upon the most vulnerable in society in order to create a criminal empire a lucrative criminal empire that sees profit in their pockets. We as communities, we as political leaders must do more, and collectively we can do more. We can educate our communities not to support these criminal individuals by purchasing their knocked off goods, by turning their backs on the drug dealers, by turning their backs on those individuals who rule communities by fear. Mr. Speaker, um, just very quickly, I'd like to point to, um, in my own constituency, as been alluded to by my friend uh, for East Belfast, Ms. Bunting, um, Mr. Ogle, a family man, an East Belfast man through and through, was, so, was very savagely and barbarically beaten and stabbed to death by these individuals who betray themselves as protectors of our community. They left a man dying. They left a man bleeding and his life ebbing away while they run into the dark, Mr. Speaker. Is that defenders of our community, I asked? Certainly not. Mr. Speaker, I served in Afghanistan where real men have went. These individuals are not real men. They're cards. They prey on the vulnerable in our communities. Mr. Speaker, I would also point very quickly to restorative justice as I've seen it in action. I do believe that restorative justice can help some of our vulnerable young people in society move away from the clutches of those paramilitary gangs, those brigadiers that my colleague Duke Beatty alluded to, those brigadiers who send out those young vulnerable foot soldiers to do their bidding while they profit from the misery of others. Mr Speaker, we can and must do more. Our actions need to speak louder than our words. It's okay across this chamber we can easily condemn bombings and shootings and we highlight statistics but behind those statistics, Mr. Speaker, are families, they're individuals, they're people who have had their lives ruined. I pay tribute to the Ogle family who have stood, stood head and shoulders above these criminals, and we need to support them in the days ahead. I would call on the Justice Minister to review our bail system and look at how we can uh, uh, tighten that up because individuals are being released. And in our malign society, we see individuals of paramilitaries being able to come out and intimidate the families um, and the, the witnesses in respect to this. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Okay, thank you. Uh, I now call on the Justice Minister to respond. You have 15 minutes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I want to thank the members who brought this uh, motion and the amendment today and allowed us to have a debate about something that I think is hugely important. Paramilitary groups continue to exploit communities in Northern Ireland and harm people through their criminality and coercive control. They destroy lives and hurt the people they so often claim to represent. And it's right that we discuss these issues together and how we can make our community a safer and a better place. It's over 20 years since the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. Yet, unfortunately, despite the passage of time and the progress we have seen during the intervening years, paramilitary groups remain active and involved in activities that inflict serious harm. The brutal reality is that this includes murder. Andy Allen, Joanne Bunting and Doug Beatty raised two paramilitary-related murders in my own constituency, that of Robert McCartney and of Ian Ogle, two families who lived just yards apart, but who both lost a loved one and after that continued to suffer victimisation at the hands of those responsible. 
I have personally met members of both families and will be meeting with the Ogle family again later this month. Um, I want to hear the concerns that they have and respond to them if I can. I also met with the family of Paul Quinn, whose pain on the loss of their son has been compounded by the smear attached to his name. And so I would take this opportunity to call on anyone who has any information on any of these murders or the other paramilitary murders that have, have happened um, in our community to cooperate with the police and bring those responsible to justice. Sadly, another constituent of mine was named in this debate, and I will just reference very briefly that of Ian Ismay. Adrian Ismay, um, and also of David Black, in respect of the targeting of prison officers um, from within prison by Robbie Butler. It was raised in the context of the separated regime that exists in the Northern Ireland Prison Service, and I want to assure members that the Prison Service remains, to committed, uh, remains committed to finding ways to address what are very challenging issues as associated with the operation of the separated regime, and to keeping people safe both within and outside the prison, not least of all prison officers who are in the front line. It also, um, in terms of paramilitary activity in our community, involves beatings, attacks meted out to vulnerable members of the community, drug dealing, intimidation, racketeering. More often than not, it's driven by sheer greed, with disdain for the safety and welfare of the public, as Andy Allen rightly noted. We must not normalise this as an accepted part of Northern Ireland life. Paramilitarism is about making money by controlling and exploiting communities, particularly those who are most vulnerable. The law enforcement response led by the Police Service of Northern Ireland and the laws, policies and processes relating to the criminal justice system, supported by my department, are clearly an important part of the response. But equally to view paramilitarism as an issue to be addressed solely through a law enforcement response, takes a narrow approach and one which is unlikely to address all of the issues effectively. Paramilitarism is a legacy of our troubled past here in Northern Ireland and there are many interlinking and systemic factors that need to be addressed so that collectively we can enjoy a society free of paramilitaries, their structures and their influence. This is a complex task and it means facing up to hitherto divisive and difficult issues on a collaborative basis. It requires not just a strategy but also political leadership in this chamber and in local communities. As members will know, the work has already begun through the Executive Action Plan on tackling paramilitary activity, criminality and organised crime. This plan was the executive response to the Fresh Start Agreement and to 38 separate recommendations made by an independent panel. Again, while this work is coordinated by a team within my department, it is a cross-executive effort to address both the harm caused by paramilitarism and the underlying issues which make both, which make both individuals and communities vulnerable to their influence. Activities under the Action Plan are delivered using four different mutually reinforcing approaches. Long-term prevention, building capacity to support transition, building confidence in the justice system and strategies and powers to tackle criminality. And I want to touch on each of those briefly. Delivery partners are drawn not only from government departments but from a wide range of statutory, voluntary and community organisations because it is by working together on that basis we can make an impact. Turning first to long-term prevention. This is aimed at creating a society where paramilitarism has no place and involves supporting vulnerable people, particularly our young people, who are at risk of harm from paramilitarism and criminality. It's delivered through intensive mentoring and support, boosting the integration and rehabilitation of people with convictions, promoting uh, public awareness and resistance to issues such as so-called paramilitary-style attacks, and empowering teachers and youth workers to support young people who may be most vulnerable to coercive control. A very positive example of work focused on steering individuals away from harm is the Probation Board-led Aspire project, delivering interventions for young men aged 60, 16 to 30 who are marginalised in communities and at risk of becoming involved in criminality and paramilitarism. It's delivered in partnership with a range of organisations such as Niacro, Bernardo's and accredited restorative justice organisations. Peer mentoring with targeted support in relation to employment, training, housing, health and social services are all involved. Initial evaluation of findings demonstrate a positive impact that it's having, not only on the young men themselves, but on their families and communities. Similarly, the START programme, run by the Department of Education and the Education Authority, with community work organisations, provides intensive support to young people who are at risk of involvement with or harm from paramilitary activity. It has had a significant impact on the lives of young people who might otherwise have been drawn into serious offending by paramilitaries who seek to exploit them. 
These examples and the long-term prevention approach more generally highlight the importance of addressing the varied factors that affect an individual's vulnerability to paramilitarism and organised crime, which I think was referenced by Jerry Kelly and others in their contributions. It's about improving educational attainment and employability, ensuring mental health support is available, addressing issues around alcohol and substance abuse, and working together better in terms of early intervention, tailoring supports to individual needs. The nature of the challenge is such that we have to work together across the executive if we're to meet our ambitions. The second approach is that about building capacity to support transition. We need to develop capacity among individuals and communities and our society as a whole to resist paramilitary influence. Delivery in this area includes the role of women in community development, creating opportunities for children and young people, and better aligning our efforts in places impacted by paramilitary control. The Department for Communities and other community partners, for example, lead on Women in Community Transformation Programme, supporting women improving their skills in areas such as leadership, mentoring, peace building and personal development. And the Executive Office also delivers a broad range of projects designed to build community capacity as part of its communities in transition work. It is important that collectively we take a more coherent, consistent and holistic approach to tackling paramilitarism by enhancing community resilience and providing the space within which new voices can be heard. Paul Given in particular raised the issue of police and other statutory agencies who are required in certain circumstances to engage with people within the community um, who set themselves up as gatekeepers. Whilst recognising the people who have former paramilitary links are members of the community and have a right to express their opinions, it should be on the same basis as everyone else. It's important we don't reinforce that status of gatekeepers to those who have coercive control over communities, and we should be mindful that engaging with them can send out negative messages to those who would otherwise want to help the police in terms of providing information and cooperating with their inquiries into paramilitarism. Political leadership is necessary to invoke change and enable us to engage with communities in a way which bypass those gatekeepers. The aim is not to exclude them from having their view heard, but to ensure that they don't control who else can be heard. And I welcome the very strong statement to that effect by Andrew Muir in particular on this issue. There are two other thematic approaches under the Executive Action Plan relating to the criminal justice sphere, one of which is building confidence in the justice system. We know that the pace of justice can impact on victims and witnesses who have been affected by paramilitary or criminal activity. It can affect communities who understandably want to see paramilitary offenders dealt with speedily by the courts. Central to this approach is work by my department to speed up the justice system. Part of this will be through the reform of committal proceedings. It's a legislative priority for me, and I trust members will wholeheartedly support it when put before the Assembly later this year. Other partners, such as policing and community safety partnerships and community planning partnerships, are actively integrating concepts around lawfulness and confidence in the rule of law into their daily outputs. Paul Frew and Matthew O'Toole, as well as others, rightly said the crucial role that historic narratives can have in terms of those engaged in or vulnerable to becoming engaged in paramilitarism today, and we should not let the past cast a shadow over the current and future arrangements. This provides a solid basis, I believe, by working through um, those community organisations to have a better understanding of how paramilitarism affects communities and help inform our long-term responses. Um, I want to get through, and I'm, I'm quite short for time. The final thematic approach is around strategies and powers to tackle criminal activity. The key delivery partner here is the Paramilitary Crime Task Force, set up in 2016 as a dedicated investigative capacity to tackle all forms of criminality linked to paramilitarism. Along with the PSNI, the National Crime Agency, and HM Revenue and Customs, it has proven to be a valuable additional capacity and has delivered a number of operational successes over the years. In tandem, bespoke organised crime legislation is being developed as a means of enhancing the existing framework that criminal justice partners can draw upon in seeking to bring offenders to justice. There are other important multi-agency collaboration structures in place to help tackle serious organised crime, including that related to paramilitarism. For example, the Organised Crime Task Force, coordinated by my department, provides a forum for strategic leadership in response to organised crime, bringing together key law enforcement partners, as well as providing forum for engagement with other government departments and statutory agencies in a number of expert-led groups. And the Joint Agency Task Force provides an important mechanism for law enforcement to work in partnership 
with their counterparts in Ireland to tackle criminality on both sides of the border. Patsy McGlone and others referenced the issue of introducing unexplained wealth orders and the commencement of the Criminal Finances Act here. And the commencement of those new asset recovery powers is a priority for me. I want to see legislative, legislative consent for the Criminal Finances Act achieved before the summer and full commencement of the powers before the end of this year. I want to ensure that the UWO powers and other powers under the Criminal Finances Act are available to the relevant enforcement agencies. And so we're going to take forward the work to ensure uh, we can achieve the legislative consent of the Assembly as a matter of priority. These measures, along with others already available under the Proceeds of Crime Act, are important. They hit the criminals where it hurts, in their pockets. More than this, they help send a powerful message, particularly to those who may be vulnerable, that crime will not pay. And that, in turn, helps reinforce community confidence in the justice system. I'm already reviewing specific powers to tackle organised crime in Northern Ireland, which was another action under the Tackling Paramilitary Activity, Criminality and Organised Crime Action Plan. Unlike other jurisdictions, there's no explicit legislation in Northern Ireland to tackle serious and organised crime. And so we have reviewed several legislative models and worked with law enforcement to develop draft proposals for Northern Ireland. And these include offences of participating in and directing organised crime as well as aggregated, uh, aggravated offences. Today calls for the proper resourcing of the PSNI and other agencies to address paramilitarism and also others emphasise, I think Sean Lynch in particular, the importance of community-based policing. The action plan has provided additional funding to a wide range of bodies, including the PSNI, and the nature of the funding, I think, reflects the complexities of the issues at hand. However, the current funding period for that action plan finishes in March 2021, and so I hope that I have your support as I go to my executive colleagues for continued funding. Mr Speaker, as I have outlined, paramilitary influence is still a feature of day-to-day -day life here for some communities. That's not acceptable. We have to continue to challenge attempts by paramilitary groups to control people and communities and to recruit into their ranks. We have to provide better prospects for young people who feel like there are no alternatives. We must take every opportunity to develop individual, community and societal resistance to paramilitary influence and criminal harm. And we have to be open to new ideas and approaches about how we can actually develop this action plan. We also can't shy away from the fact that this needs to be underpinned by a fundamental positive shift in areas such as good relations and continuing to work in, against sectarianism. Very clearly, this must remain a shared task across the executive and assembly. In conclusion, Mr Speaker, I want to close my remarks by supporting the motion and amendment today. In doing so, I want to reiterate the need to continue work on a collective cross-executive basis as a priority in our programme for government to tackle the wider issues so that we can reach a point where paramilitarism and its structures is confined to a very dark chapter in our history books. Thank you. And I call point of order. Uh, Mr Speaker, is it it's plainly in contravention of the most basic elements of democratic debate to have discussion like this and not call a speaker from a single non-executive party. So I would ask, what does the executive have to have when it comes to paramilitarism? I don't understand your question because the executive doesn't determine the time this uh, assembly meets and discusses any business. So the business committee, which represents main, most of the parties, actually sets the time for these debates not to an executive or anybody else. So there's nobody been excluded from the debate here. So I will call on Dolores Kelly to wind on the amendment. You have five minutes. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and can I acknowledge the cross-party uh, support for the amendment and the motion and thank all the speakers who took part in the debate. And I particularly want to acknowledge the presence uh, of the Ogle family in the public gallery and also the bravery of many families who have stood against paramilitarism, uh, uh, those of Paul Quinn in particular and indeed Robert McCartney and Laura McKay. And what we see is the coercive control and the, uh, the silence, the omerta that prevents witnesses come, come, from coming forward. It's never too late uh, to come forward. I would ask anyone who still has information to give that 
to the, the police to help them with their investigation and to bring the perpetrators to justice. Both the motion and the amendment uh, looks, uh, and indeed the Justice Minister's response, uh, does demonstrate the need for a collaborative approach for political leadership. And many commentators and participants in the debate acknowledged that we, as an executive and an assembly, have a crucial role to play in supporting those who suffer the most, who have been left behind uh, 22 years on from the Good Friday Agreement and still suffering uh, the, from the violence and the extortion and blackmail and drug dealing and criminality of those who call themselves uh, paramilitaries. Uh, the, um, many many uh, other uh, speakers acknowledged uh, the uh, separated prison regime and the difficulty that causes and, and the messages it can send out. And I note the Justice Minister has said that she is doing some work. And that I also acknowledge the additional cost to the prison, uh, I think of some three or four million pounds annually, that such a regime uh, cost the, the public purse here in Northern Ireland, which has not been funded uh, by the Treasury. And no doubt uh, the Finance Minister might take that up in his uh, deliberations uh, with uh, the uh, Treasury over the coming days and weeks. Unexplained wealth orders uh, would go a long way in providing uh, confidence to communities and to people who want to step forward. But it's not just enough around unexplained wealth orders today. We also need to uh, look at uh, the financial resources available to other paramilitary uh, combatants in the past and the a, a front to democracy across this island uh, that we don't uh, not go after criminality and organised crimes right across society and all those who have benefited uh, both today and in the past in relation to their uh, large scale smuggling, their waste. Uh, management crimes, uh, as uh, Andrew Muir so eloquently put it in, in, in relation to all of those uh, systems uh, that a blind eye was turned to by the British government in particular, I'd have to say. But all members uh, also, not all members, but most members recognise the importance that former paramilitaries can play in transitioning. And I think as Andrew Muir also said about David Trimble's just because you have a past doesn't mean to say you can't have a future. And I think we would all want to work towards enabling those people who, uh, yes, uh, as Christopher Stalford said, made a decision to engage in acts of violence, but there were environmental and other factors which played a role, in not least poverty and deprivation in relation to getting involved. So therefore, it's important that we help people uh, across the community uh, to make the shift uh, from violence into uh, uh, being a positive influence uh, within our communities. Uh, uh, other members uh, uh, talked about uh, the Assets Recovery Agency. I think there's a challenge laid down uh, that it should actually be reinstated in North, in here in Northern Ireland. And I don't think that's something that we would be opposed to. We all know that there are over uh, 40 criminal gangs operating here in Northern Ireland alone. And the NCA uh, established here in Northern Ireland, it was the right thing to do and the SDLP in, in particular played a key role in ensuring that its code of ethics and its accountability mechanisms to the policing board. And at this point I should acknowledge that I was a member, I am a member of the policing board, uh, that uh, we, we played in establishing it here but that uh, we worry uh, that its uh, resources uh, would be going after the larger international criminal gangs and not having sufficient focus here in Northern Ireland. And that's why the Asset Recovery Agency played such a critical role. Can I, in particular, Mr. Speaker, thank uh, Mr. Paul Frew for his acknowledgement of the SDLP's consistent uh, opposition to violence, both in the past and today. Uh, I'm going to bring your remarks to a close. <laughs> so, your uh, member's time will be up. Yes. So, so Mr Speaker, uh, I, I acknowledge the, the positive contributions and I hope that we do show and that today shows that we are given political leadership uh, in, in this uh, challenge to tackle paramilitarism in all its forms. Thank you. And I call Meg Nesbitt to conclude and wind on the debate uh, on the substantive motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank all the contributors. And, and caution, I am unlikely to give way, as I don't think 10 minutes is going to be sufficient uh, for my comments. I want to begin with, with the terminology, because I think we're all being very polite, calling these groups paramilitaries. That's the way they're organized. But it's not their intent or their purpose. Their intent is terrorism. And to prove it, let's look at 
the 2000 Terrorism Act, which says terrorism means the use or threat of action where the use of threat is designed to influence a government or to intimidate the public or a section of the public. I think that describes admirably all the groups Doug Beatty uh, described opening uh, this debate. Terrorism is an absolute, as in it is absolutely wrong. And if, as some members have done, stray by saying it is justified by the circumstances, you create a problem. Because you may say, well, the circumstances have changed, so terrorism is no longer justified. But others don't. Others say, oh no, the circumstances still justify. And that's when groups like the new IRA murder people like Lyra McKee. And I'm very glad to hear support for the idea that terrorism is an absolute from people like Andrew Muir of the Alliance, Matthew O'Toole of the SDLP, and Paul Frew of the DUP. And Paul went on, of course, to remind us that the IRA hurt their own, tarring and feathering, kneecapping, coercive control of their communities. Not something we hear very often from the benches opposite. Although, in the Shared Ireland podcast that I did with uh, Linda Dillon, I was glad to hear her acknowledge the hurt and the legacy within her own community created by the IRA. But this, Mr. Speaker, is not an attack by me on the IRA. Uh, Newton Ards is the main town in my constituency. We have every shade of unionist terror group, including the South Antrim UDA. What are they doing at the top of the Ards Peninsula? And Mr. Muir made clear the impact. The number of people intimidated out of their homes in recent years doubled because of, of these groups. In proposing uh, the motion, Doug Beatty gave us a list of the terror groups, of the attacks, of the assault weapons, of the fact it's all about these days extortion, coercion, drug dealing, community control. And he gave the example of the murder of, of Ian Ogle. And of course, he rightly reminded us that the House rejected his plea to change the segregated prison regime, leading to the ridiculous situation where a criminal goes in convicted of criminality only to assume the role of a brigadier of a terrorist organization. In proposing the amendment, Patsy McGlone focused on unexplained wealth orders uh, and the cracking down on what he called Mr. Bling. And he reminded me uh, of a friend who's a producer at the BBC who took his wife for a meal one night and in came a very well-known loyalist brigadier with his entourage and they sat at the next table and he got quite excited because he thought, this guy has no idea who I am. I'm behind the scenes, faceless producer. Perhaps I'm going to learn a lot about this organization. And he did learn a lot because they spoke very freely, comparing the local gymnasia, talking about the best holiday destinations and where to buy the best men's clothing. That was their motivation for being in their paramilitary or terrorist grouping. There was an intervention from Dolores Kelly uh, talking about the need to establish the truth from the past. But I, I remind her that perhaps the primary source of wisdom on this is the consultative group in the past, the Eames Bradley group, who stopped talking about truth recovery and said, no, we have to talk about information recovery. Because if we have a body like the Independent Commission on Information Retrieval, we must be aware that the terror groups are less likely to tell the real truth of what happened to people's loved ones and much more likely to tell you what they want you to think. Because they are responsible for some of the grossest human rights abuses and they're embarrassed and they will want to rewrite history to try and write those human rights abuses uh, out of memory. Jerry Kelly uh, focused on socio-economic deprivation. And I don't disagree with him, but I have to say to somebody like Mr. Kelly, if you supported the IRA, you can't blame others for socio-economic deprivation without acknowledging the deliberate economic carnage that the IRA inflicted with their bombing campaigns over three decades. Joanne Bunting talked about the scandal uh, of 22 years on from the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. I could say to her, Yes, and 26 years on from the ceasefires. And she underlined Patsy McGlone's analysis 
that the people's motivation in these groups is for the personal lifestyle. And she gave us the statistics of people living in communities who say, we no longer want those groups, those paramilitary terrorist organizations, to do what they claim they're doing, which is to keep us safe. Those days have gone. Mr. Speaker, Hansard may prove me wrong, but I tried to listen to Sean Lynch very, very carefully. Uh, and in doing so, I believe he used the term crime or criminal or criminality no fewer than 15 times. But again, I say to him, these things are absolute. So if it's criminality today, it was criminality in the 1970s, it was criminality in the 1980s, and it was criminality in the 1990s. Uh, Matthew O'Toole, I think in his first contribution in this is issue since he joined us in the House, uh, declined the opportunity to discuss and dwell on the past, but focused on the inextricable link between socio-economic deprivation and the suffering of the communities at the hands uh, of these groups. Andy Allen, in a very short but very passionate contribution, uh, talked about the need to educate the community because there's always a temptation uh, that the paramilitaries are offering a cheap bargain. And don't we all like a bargain? But they're not bargains. They're being sucked in and they are promoting and helping establish and fulfill and fuel these terrorist organizations. And, and I admire Andy because he did, as he said, serve in Afghanistan, where he almost paid the ultimate sacrifice. And for him, to call these people cards has to have a moral authority that I could never deliver uh, in this house. Uh, and so we come to the response from uh, the minister, Naomi Long, uh, who talked about the need for a systemic approach to tackling these issues, the need not just for strategy but also for political leadership, and, and I agree with her. Uh, and in her contribution, uh, she dwelt uh, at some length on the Executive's Action Plan uh, and its four strands. And again, I listened very carefully to the Minister. Uh, but I have to say to her, and, and I do so with respect, all I heard was about the inputs of government. Nothing about the impact, no outcomes, Minister. And I suggest to you that the victims and the people who are under the coercion of these paramilitary organized terror groups are only interested in outcomes. Not in the structures, not in the strategies, not in the systemic approaches. What they want to see is action which leads to outcomes, which gets these people off their backs. So, Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank all the contributors. I think it has been a mature debate. Uh, I think we've discussed issues uh, in some depth. And so I thank, I thank members. Uh, I thank my colleagues for bringing forward the motion. I thank the SDLP uh, for the amendment, which absolutely adds value. I'm very happy uh, to support it. But there's another group we should be hearing from tonight people we should really be listening to are in the public gallery. We should be listening to the Ogles. We should be hearing uh, what they have to say. And Mr. Speaker, I do look forward, after this debate is over, uh, to listening to them sharing their views on what they think was achieved in the last hour and a half. Thank you, members. And the question is that the amendment standing in the names of Patty McLone and Dolores Kelly be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The next